Hey, hey, hello. <sighs> okay. Uh, hold on, just sending a text. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. How are you? I'm fabulous. Can I just tell you that I'm fangirling right now? Like, it's so hard. <laughs> so, so very hard. Thank you. I, uh, first of all, I'm Linda with EUR Web. Hi, Linda. Uh, I have been uh, your virtual mentee for many years. <laughs> I'm definitely a reader, hashtag. Oh, hey, readers. Yes. And yes. <laughs> So thank you so much for uh, taking the time to sit down with me. I'm just I'm sure. like in awe. So if I go through my <laughs> words a little bit crazy, bear with me. Not a problem. So what I find so first of all, what I find so interesting about the sit-in is that when I bring it to present day and you and your journey and how you held down um, hosting AMTV for many years and most recently got promoted to evening news and when we look at evening news we do not see a lot of black people and specifically black women in the market holding it down for anywhere like you can't see it anywhere so fast forward to the sit-in where i had no idea that this was even a thing back in 1968 harry belafonte sat in for uh johnny carson on the tonight show 1968 to 2020 and yet here we still are yeah. why why is that joy you know the thing is is that the you know for any one to get into the position that i'm in to the position that you're in there has to be a pipeline right so what is the pipeline for getting to late night typically the pipeline is comedy um you know a world in which other than you know, we have more people now, but back then you didn't even have Eddie Murphy. You had very few people um, who were even in the pipeline to get anywhere close to late night. And then you think about who's in management. Um, back in the 1960s, you're talking about a sea of white men and that's yeah. in charge and that's it. There weren't any women, there weren't people of color. That's it. That is who was running Hollywood and television networks and everything, all the writers, all the staff, all the crew. And so when you think about it, the, the quickest way, the clearest way for a, a black voice to break in, particularly to late night, which is still a very white male space, even today. Yeah. Right? Was for somebody with real power to give up his seat. And that's what Johnny Carson did. He gave up his seat during one of the most momentous years in American civil rights history with all that was happening in the late 1960s. The riots, which by the way, were almost all Black Lives Matter related. They were almost all related to a police officer killing a Black person. And then the community goes up in flames. That's what was happening in the late 1960s. There were George Floyds like all over America all the time. Mm -hmm. And you also had the continuing struggle over civil rights. The Civil Rights Act passed with no voting rights in it. Then the Voting Rights Act passed after John Lewis got almost beaten to death in Selma. And it just kept going and going. You just had the Fair Housing Act passed in 1968. So this was a really difficult time in American history. So for Johnny Carson to give up his seat and say to all those white men in the suites, I'm giving it to him. And they were probably like, giving it to who? <laughs> what? Right an entertainer but they probably thought you know what it'll be fine he's an entertainer forgetting he was also somebody who was funding the civil rights movement he was friends with dr king he was convening with dr king he was putting money into the march on washington he was an activist mm -hmm. and so when they gave him that seat he took full advantage of it and he forced america during their fun hour to confront themselves and confront their history that's incredibly brave now do you think that the reason that Harry Belafonte was able to sit for that week for Johnny Carson was because back in those times, he was considered a crossover hit. So people were not necessarily looking at the color of his skin, but the fact that he was a world renowned entertainer. Well, he was, he was considered a crossover hit, but remember, you know, this is back in an era when black men, um, it was very dicey, the idea of playing, of having a black man even play a lead. Mm -hmm. it, you know, in a movie, because there was an, a, a concern that, first of all, in the South, theaters wouldn't run the movie, right? right? If there was any interracial relationship, theaters would in the South would definitely not run the movie. There was a lot of controversy even about Harry Belafonte and the thought that maybe he was too beautiful to be in Hollywood because white women might be attracted to him. 
And right. so he was already a figure who, despite his crossover appeal, that was part of the controversy about him was that he had crossover appeal. Um, and so everything about him was controversial. He was also a loud and proud civil rights activist who didn't care what anybody knew about it, you know, that anybody knew about it. And he was open about his disdain for hate, his disdain for segregation, his disdain, you know, for the, the, the sort of continuing apartheid in America. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I think because he was an entertainer, because he was the guy who did the Caribbean, you know, themed songs and appeared in sort of light kind of movies, I don't think they saw him coming. I really genuinely don't think that the executives knew what they were getting. And when he finally casted that week, and it was, yes, it was his friends, it was the Lena Horns. She was also a civil rights activist. Mm -hmm. She had a very strong opinion. I think that they just thought that black people were just entertaining and didn't understand how serious these black folk were about civil rights, but they sure found out. Absolutely. And then uh, watching the sit-in and the moment that uh, Harry Belafonte was able to open the heart, so to speak, of Bobby Kennedy to the plight of not only uh, poor people, but uh, Af the African-American plight, he finally kind of got it. Joy, I, I look at that moment and I just think 2020, how, how is it different? Because we need change and we need change in the structure of our government, the, the lawmakers, the legislation, the people that are voted in, like all of it. And so I guess my question to you, 1968 to 2020, how far have we really come and what has changed? Because we're dealing with the same issues. Yeah, we are dealing with, with a lot of the same issues. And listen, I mean, we're still dealing with whether or not we have the right to vote. Think about that. You know, yeah. the Voting Rights Act peeled back by the Supreme Court, uh, by the John Roberts Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, in order for somebody's heart to be open, it has to be openable. And I think one of the things about Bobby Kennedy is his heart was openable. You know, he was somebody who had sat with Lorraine Hansberry and enraged her when he really wasn't willing to go far as far as she wanted him to go. The Kennedys came a long way in a very short time in terms of their concern about civil rights and their willingness to do something about it. And Bobby Kennedy was one of them who went a long way. By the time he was running for president, he was a different person. You know, he was somebody who had, had suggested the poor people's campaign would be a good idea to, you know, to, to Dr. King. So he was just a different guy. He had an openable heart. And I think that, you know, the frustration now is that there are a lot of unopenable hearts in this country right now. There are people who are bound and determined to drag us back, not even to the fifties, to the twenties, mm -hmm. to drag us backwards. And they're so determined to drag us backwards that there's nothing you can really do about them. And so I think what, what you, what, what you can take from this piece and what you can take from what Harry Belafonte managed to do is that yes, you can open some hearts who are willing, but you also have to sometimes drag folks where they don't want to be. Ah. And he you know, didn't wait for permission to tell the stories that Dr. King was willing to tell or to challenge Bobby Kennedy or to bring on the Lena Horns of the world who would talk civil rights and not just entertain. He just did it. And so I think what people should do is just do it, you know? Uh -huh. Do the activism that's inside of you. Speak the truth that is inside of you. And don't worry about the people who can't be moved because what you really need to do is outnumber them. And as long as you outnumber them, they don't need to be moved. I love that. I love that answer. Uh, my last question. So 1968, we see Harry Belafonte sit in for Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. Fast forward to the 80s, Arsenio Hall for Late Night Host. Fast forward to 2020. Um, when when are we going to get more late night hosts of color on TV? Well, we have the daily, we have the daily show yeah. exactly. Yeah, I mean, and again, that was another instance in which you know a black host took over for a white host after you know being filling in for him. And I mean, look, I you know I took over the show I'm on after filling in for many years for Chris Matthews. Right? There's always a succession, and you have to be in the pipeline in order to be able to you know get in the chair. You know, I've had that in my own experience as well. And so I think for late night, either we need to open up more spaces, or people need to see their spots because the reality is it is still a very white male space. There aren't even a lot of women, you know, that have um, women of any race that have late night shows. And so I think because we have many, many more 
uh, media available. It isn't just the three big networks. Back then it was a lockout because it was three networks and that's all there was. It's not like that anymore. There are a lot more opportunities and people are making opportunities. Look at Ava DuVernay's career, yeah. you know, you know, look at um, Key and Peele and what they've been able to create outside of that show and creating their own space for movies and television series. And you have so many creative people now. We have own, we have so many different spaces. And so I, I'm not really worried about late night necessarily having to, you know, um, open up all of its spots to people of color. I think we need to open our own spots. We need to create our own opportunities create more of these venues and look at the new venues where there are opportunities because there really are so many and we're not dependent on just those three networks to give us a chance to get in the door i love that so remember my face joy because i'm gonna <laughs> slide i'm gonna slide into your dms and say remember you. i'm your mentee okay here i, I am I will. I will. Absolutely. Send me, and actually, um, my publicist is on here too. Just shoot her your information and, and we can connect. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. Of course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.